You know when you go to a concert and it's like punk rock music or something, and the kids get on stage and they jump into the crowd? It's called stage diving, right? Some people think that's dangerous, but not me, because humans are made out of 95% water. <laughs> so the audience is 5% away from a pool. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're back with a comedian. Why? Because we need to laugh as much as we need to learn. And we get a lot of stress, so this helps kind of like eliminate a lot of it. And it's healthy for you. Laugh for the best medicine. Welcome, Mitch Hedberg. Hey, how you doing, Barry? Good What's to see you. Good After to see you. After that Letterman stint, uh, I saw you a couple times on Letterman, right? Yeah, I, I just did it for the third time uh, a couple days ago. Third time? Yeah. Now, well, let's talk about this. Let me Take me through your background, where you grew up, and, and, and kind of the, I think, what, at age 12 was your first appearance in... Uh, on the stage? I, oh, on stage, yeah. I was going to say I, I appeared at zero, but, you know, I mean, my first <laughs> stage appearance was 12, man. But, uh, you know, when you were doing that thing at the beginning of the show where you are talking about my story, man, it sounded way more inspirational than I ever thought it was, man. I kind of got tears in my eye for a minute there. I realized things are going pretty good for me, you know? Well, you, you accomplished a lot. You were, talk about when you, you know, were you a cook for years and, <clears throat> and how you made that transition. Well, I used to be really infatuated with the grill when I was a busboy. I would watch these guys cook, and I, you know, I finally I, I achieved my dream of becoming a cook, which was really easy because all I had to do is tell the manager, "Hey, man, do you mind if I cook?" And he said, "Yeah." You know, it was real simple to achieve that dream. And I, <laughs> no, no, it's really the point. Is that cool? But so I, I, I actually thought, you know, cooking what might, might be what I wanted to do for a while, you know. But then, uh, since like you said, at twelve I started, I, I was performing, I was acting a lot. Of, like we would take, uh, we would copy Saturday Night Live skits and uh, SCTV. You know that show? Yes, yeah. Yeah, man, like uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie. You remember mm -hmm. them characters? They had that great movie called Strange Brew. But we would just copy those skits and we would make our friends laugh. And, and of course, there's nothing like standing in front of uh, people and making them laugh as long as you're trying to. You know, I mean, if they're laughing at you for the wrong reasons, it kind of sucks. <laughs> No, like, no, this was in your basement, or it was uh, with, with your neighborhood friends, right? Yeah, yeah, in, in my parents' basement, because my parents were the ones who would always let the kids come over and mm -hmm. mess up the house for the day, and uh, we would put on these skits, and everyone was talented, but now no one does anything in the talent industry except me. I'm the only one who survived the, through the years, <laughs> man, through the lean years. You know, they all gave it up when times got tough. They were like 15, and they said, no more of this, you know. Yeah. Tell me about that, because every time I had, you know, you have Don Rickles we had on, we had uh, different comedians from all different backgrounds, and they had m many years of adversity where they were not making it, they were getting rejected. Right. Why is that important to go through that, and what did uh, you learn? Oh, uh, because it, it builds you, and, you know, it, it makes your skin tough, you know, and uh, rejection is, is real tough at first, but after a while, you kind of thrive on it. It's an energy in itself just to get rejected. Talk about that. Well, because you want, you want to prove people that, you know, they're wrong, man. Like, mm -hmm. like when I first started doing comedy, people would try to tell me how to dress, and they would try to tell me like, kind of what kind of jokes to do, and they wanted me to go to like a, a stand-up comedy class and have some other guy tell me how to be funny, you know, man. Mm -hmm. and, and funny is natural, you know, you, don't, you can't learn how to be funny, you know. You, you can learn how to say a joke in a certain rhythm, but you can't learn how to be funny. And I knew that, but these people were trying to tell me, right, you got to come to class, and, and we'll tell you like how to present yourself and everything. And all so, that, go ahead. No, no, so, so believing inside, not letting them try to change the outside of you. Right, right. Because this, this one lady at one point, she gave me advice. I got a lot of advice in the early days of my comedy. And one lady told me to wear a lot of jewelry on stage. You know, because she thought like I wanted to attract the crowd, you know, just with my jewelry, you know, they'd be so they'd be so excited that I had this like brooch on or something. They forget that I'm funny, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of, a lot of advice comes from people who aren't very funny. They have they have adapted ways to like remain working because they're real professional, they, they always wear a suit and tie, you know, so, mm -hmm. so that, a lot of advice I was getting was from comics who, who weren't that good and I, I never could take it, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Man, I, I knew that I had like a, a different thing to say to them, so I had, I had to chill out and just ride out the bad times like that. So, but, the, but you talk about rejection, being able to take, makes you stronger, proving other people wrong, that's a real important point, a lot of people that devastates them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have right. you ever had a situation where you just bombed? Where I bombed on stage? Mm -hmm. Oh, many situations, man. Pluralize that immediately because <laughs> I've bombed endlessly. You know, I, I used to tour Montana and Idaho and uh, Oregon to these one-nighter bars. I'd go from bar to bar, and I'd be the opening act out of a two-man show. And the guy going on last would always kill. I would always bomb horribly. Then the next guy would go on. He'd have a lot of jokes about like genitalia and such, which the crowds kind of wanted to hear. They liked that stuff. But I, I didn't have any of those jokes, so I was bombing. But the only good thing about that was is a lot of times these towns would be loaded with kind of like scary looking women and and the scary looking women would always ask the funnier guy to dance so i never had to dance you know it was cool good, this, I, there's always something good and something bad right yeah i just had to sit down because no they were too they, they didn't like me because i wasn't funny so they didn't want to dance with me you know so now, now 
now that adversity helped you? I mean, that's rejection, that's falling. It helps you kind of come back stronger. Do you focus? Do you learn something from that? Oh, uh, well, you just learn. You just learn that you know you got to get the hell out of here and find your right. You got to find your audience, man. The adversity is like you just got to keep searching for your audience. Is what it does. It just makes you search harder. Is what it does. That's good. Yeah. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, you know why you believe that jumping in. Even though maybe you're not 100 percent prepared, it's more important than preparing and never doing anything. Obviously. Oh, that's so true, man. Yeah, you, you gotta like uh, learn while doing, right? Okay, that's yeah, the man. only way to learn. Yeah. You gotta books, tapes, all this stuff, and people. But once you do it yourself, that's the real. You can't have a good job in order to make it in stand-up comedy. You can't already have a good job. That's the biggest downfall. <laughs> really? Yeah, because you don't care. Then you just you don't care about it. You, you're already making enough money, so the drive ain't there. You gotta mm -hmm. like be in a job that's worse than anything you want. That'll, that'll keep you wanting to do it, you know. Well, we'll come back with uh, something about uh, our guest here, Mitch Hedberg, who Time Magazine calls the next Seinfeld and what he thinks about that. Don't go away. I'm not into sports very much. People think I'm into sports because I'm a man. Like I was at a convenience store and a guy with a quart of milk approached me. He said, hey, what's the score? I said, I don't know. What's the game? <laughs> if it's a contest between me and you, and the object is to ask the other contestant questions that befuddle him, then you're ahead one to nothing. <laughs> Welcome back. With Mitch Hedberg, uh, a rising star, they call it. Now, uh, Time Magazine said that you're like the next Seinfeld, and you make comments about that. That's amazing to me. You know, I, I was at the Montreal Comedy Festival, and the guy who wrote the article was there, and, and he, uh, he took a liking to my comedy. And he, he took my picture, and he put it in Time Magazine, full length. You know, you could even see my feet, you know. You see <laughs> my head to my feet, and uh, I picked it up in a, a gas station in Iowa, and I flipped over, and I was just blown away. But, but he called me the next Seinfeld, I think only because I have a sitcom deal now. and and. Right now, since he just went off the air, everyone's looking for the next sitcom star, stand-up mm -hmm. guy. So they're kind of they're trying to peg me as that guy. I, we're not really. Puts similar. a lot of pressure on you when they do that. Yeah, yeah, because people kind of make they mock me because of it now. They say, "Oh, you're the next Seinfeld," huh? you mm -hmm. know. But I hope I at least get to go out with his old girlfriend. You know, <laughs> do you? Shoshona, what's her name? Yeah. yeah, maybe that. You know, maybe being the next Seinfeld, like that'll hook me up with her. I'm gonna send her the issue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? See, I'm the next Seinfeld. Come on. It uh, puts pressure on you. Okay? Yeah. Tons, now, yeah. why is pressure? good I believe it's good it makes people either it makes produce you perform or perish. better yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah it makes you perform better I remember when I was a bowler you know for like a, a month I was uh if I if it was the last frame and I needed a strike you had to get a strike I would get a strike you know it just seems like when there's pressure on you to do well you seem to do well don't you don't you feel Absolutely. that way yeah well like, there's certain people like you focus or you fold you right go two ways and I, I really didn't do good on TV comedy until I was on the Letterman show. I did a lot of shows that were like way less caliber. And I, I actually had kind of bad performances on like five or six of them. And then when I finally got to the big leagues, Letterman, my first time out there, man, it really clicked hard and that was the most pressure. So Why do you think that? Why is it that it takes that kind of uh, in environment to really perform? What happens to you? Oh, because the environment is so huge that it almost makes you feel like you finally arrived. So you kind of like, you go up to the next level. You say, all right, I'm here, man. It's time to put that down the whiskey and take it for real now, you know what I mean? I, I can't be drinking before this one now, you know? No, so you drank before my show? No, huh? no, I'm okay. kidding. I don't, I don't drink before the things, not at all. That's why this is in a dark glass. <laughs> oh, you're the best. So you're starting to make me laugh. Now. Oh, that's okay, good, man. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, yeah, you lost my train of thought here, but there was something interesting. I was, you just talked about before, up to that level. Right. A lot of people like to play people like in sports who stink, so they look good. But yeah. Then oh. you lower yourself to the occasion. Right. Versus playing somebody who's good, you start playing better. Right, right. It's the same type of thing. Totally, man. Totally. Um, I, I guess I don't understand where to go with that. But, but you lost your train of thought too. Yeah, totally, <laughs> man. You're making me laugh now. But that's all that counts. I mean, you have laugh. a good time because we're the ones on the show, right? Yeah. Isn't it? So <laughs> All right, let's have a break. No, okay, let's go. No, I think we need to keep talking. Okay, I can't so, have a break. So tell me, one thing you did is, is you were a cook and you were making like a hundred bucks and all of a sudden you've got enough to make uh, your payment for rent money. Right. So you decided to jump out and do it. Oh, yeah. I, got, I got enough comedy gigs to actually go on the road. I got four gigs in one month 
which was $400 total, which was enough to pay rent and have a couple hamburgers. So I quit my job immediately and just stayed on the road as much as I could. And from then on, I just was able to build it. But I also had a girlfriend who supported me so hard, man. So I had to, I had to throw that piece of information in there too, you know? <laughs> That's she, the cut she gets the promo, right? Right, right, yeah. She, she was such a great woman, you know? She, she would take care. She had a regular job and, and she had steady income, so she helped a lot too. Well, that's important. But we'll have a show for her some other time. Right now, this is about me. <laughs> <laughs> what was, before we go to break, I want to talk about why disappointments. You, you had a quote, actually, I remember writing it down. Disappointing encounters provide material. Yeah, and oh yeah. Talk about that, because you said one show, there was a quote you said about uh, you can't please everybody all the time. Or hey, but last night, all those people were at my show. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> Because, because uh, disappointing, uh, inf uh, or disappointing situations create material just because, of course, comedy is, is always the best way to look at a bad scenario. You try to say, well, if I can take this and make people laugh for another six months doing the joke nationwide, I mean, this, this scenario is going to have totally made sense that it happened to me. So that's about the, you know, just to that. I just try to make the best. I mean, I can't make comedy out of really good situations because it's too good, you know. I just try to make it out of depressing scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> when we talk about uh, your, where you grew up and your father, I want to talk about your family. And, and, and what your father said about you that ties into the show theme. Arnie's cool, man. That's my dad. Arnie's yeah, your dad. Yeah, I like and, Arnie. And I want to talk about your family and your roots and then also talk about where you think you're going. How do you think you need to go to the next level and what are the important ingredients so that you don't fall down? Sometimes we get to... Right, right. I got uh, answers for you too, so I'll be back with answers. Don't go away. Mitch Hedberg, we'll be right back. in an apartment in Los Angeles I had a neighbor and whenever he would knock on my wall I knew he wanted me to turn my music down and that made me angry because I like loud music so when he knocked on the wall I'd mess with his head a little I'd say go around I cannot open the wall I don't know if you got a doorknob on the other side but over here there's nothing thank you very much come on how funny is this guy it's my pleasure to have you back. I was um, reading a comment uh, from your father, and uh, some of the stuff I was reading, it said, uh, uh, Arn had, Arnie, Arnie, right? Arnie, your dad? Yeah, yeah. It's like burying a piece of coal, and it turns up a diamond later. Yeah. Now, why did he say that? And tell us about your uh, beginnings. <laughs> well, he tried to kill me, so he buried me alive, and then I got out and I <laughs> made it. No, I didn't. He, he was always uh, very... Uh, he, he was always very worried about what I was doing because I didn't go to college, you know, and that, that was a big... I used to be a good student for a while, but then I, I gave up on it because it just wasn't interesting to me to be book smart, you know, so I gave up on it about 10th grade, and, and that kind of led to a, a deterioration of, uh, in their minds of, of what I was becoming, you know, they thought I was just really going downhill and I was headed for the... For was it the school or the teachers? Was it the learning or the teachers? The, w it was me, man. I mean, I, I also believe when you're uh, when you are on top of the game in school, too too many other people ain't, and, and like y you have to kind of wait for other people. So to be smart is a curse, really. Not that I'm trying to say I'm really smart, but there's a certain level that the classrooms go at, and if you're always ahead of the level, it gets boring, you know. So I just I just decided just to just to give up on it and go below the level so I could keep up that way, you know. <laughs> started ditching class a lot and missing work and missing tests and, and school became a challenge for me suddenly and you know yeah, I, I just I just gave up on the academics altogether and my dad got nervous about that you know because he, he wanted me to be a doctor or something probably he thought I was you know I was really good with numbers like math so maybe he wanted me to be an engineer but, well, but your report card I bet you is better than mine uh, well, 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 up to a point maybe you know I mean after a while the report cards are really bad there are a lot of failures I barely graduated you know right? What would you? Say, what is your definition of success now? I mean, to be able to wake up when you want—that's success. And be able to untuck your shirt, man. If you if you had to tuck in your shirt and get up at a certain hour, it's no good, man. I mean, that, <laughs> <laughs> so when you were a cook, obviously that's. Yeah, not I had to tuck my shirt into my pants and wear an apron. I just all I want to do is be able to live my day the way I want to live it, you mm -hmm. know? Because I mean, I certainly have to get up and do some things. But if if every day I had to get up force someone else constantly that's not to me success unless I'm really digging it but I can't imagine anyone digs having to give up 
every day for someone else. You know. Well, I, maybe if they love what they do. You're, that's it. Seems like that's most. If they love what they do, then getting up is not like work. It's going yeah. and having fun. Right, right. But that's a different scenario. They're they're getting up for themselves then because they love what they do. Is what you're saying. But mm -hmm. if, if if they don't love what they do, then they're not getting up for themselves. I just believe that that if you're doing what you if you're happy, it, you know, that's what success is about. Because it doesn't have to be about entertainment or making a lot of money, but. You know, you just gotta you gotta really love what you do. I'm so so uh, blessed because most of my friends they don't they don't love what they do. You know, they they do what they do, but they don't love it. And I, I'm like one of the few people who. So actually what do you say to somebody out there watching the show? And some people want to be comedians. A lot of people want to go entertainment. Yeah. A lot of people want to do things that people say you'll never do because they said, you know, you'll never make it. Remember that you talked about in the beginning. Right. What do you say to these people? Give them encouragement. Well, no, I actually I actually have let them have that attitude because if everyone feels they can make it, then you know it'll be a lot harder for people who actually do try to make it to make it. So I'm glad there's people out there who think they can't make it <laughs> so that they can make room for me, you know, because then I then I stand out. That's you know? a good answer. Right. You're a funny guy. So what's the next? Uh, what's up next for you? What? Uh, you know, um, what do you want? You said that when I asked you where the ladder of success, you're in the middle. Right. What do you think it's going to take now to go to the top? I just got to keep working. That, that's that's the biggest thing. I cannot slack off because I'm sorry. As soon as you get some attention, well, you spit on me. I know. Yeah, well, I spit on your okay, thing, man. You nobody knew that. It landed you know, right on Arnie. Now I'm going to tell the whole world <laughs> you just spit on me. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you brought it up. You spit it. Uh, by the way, it's on my nose. Uh, on my nose. <laughs> but that's successful spit coming at you there. <laughs> so you know, spit. that's a good comeback. All right, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, what was the question yeah, again? Well, oh, yeah. Talk about where you're going and how you. Oh yeah, going. I gotta keep working, man. Because if I if I if I start to slack off now, it's all over, you know. Because I got some attention on me, mm -hmm. and that means I gotta work harder. I gotta come exactly. up with new jokes, and I gotta you know I gotta do more things. Like I gotta do things like this now, which I never had to do before. But I love doing it. I just gotta stay in the ball, man. Because it's really up to me, you know. It's really up to me to keep it going now. So mm -hmm. I just gotta work hard, keep working. <laughs> And that's important because when people are going uphill, sometimes they don't see. They, yeah. It's too good. They take it easy. They coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. I, and I'm not going to coast. I'm just going to keep working. I'm going to take that. You know, they, they hand me some money now. I'm going to take that money, put it in my pocket, and just pull the notebook out and keep on writing. You know what I'm saying, <laughs> man? I'm just going to keep on writing. So. Uh, it was really good. I really enjoyed this. Uh, when we come back, we're going to come back with the tip of the day and talk about uh, final thoughts from Mitch Hedberg and uh, a few little uh, goodies for when we come back. Right? You got a good one for me, Willie? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you a joke, man. So just one? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Don't go away. Mitch Hedberg, when we come back. Welcome back. Here's the tip of the day. When times are good, it's time for massive action. And what I mean by that is a story. My son and I are riding bikes in the reservation. And we're going down this hill a little bit, so we start to coast. And I sit there, we're not pedaling. And, I'm, and George's like, he's pedaling like a maniac. <laughs> he's pedaling. I go, what are you doing? Coast a little bit. Relax. He goes, but Dad, look at that big hill coming up. We've got to pedal. We'll never get up it. And uh, I don't know, I use that as an analogy because it's usually, sometimes when things are good, we start coasting. And coasting is downhill. So when things are good, take massive action. Constantly keep going further. Don't assume that you're successful because once you do that, then you really will go downhill. So keep pedaling. And because the key is once we hit that wall, as long as we're going fast enough, we'll go right through it. So that's the whole point about ego and sometimes we think we're so great we don't have to do anything. I see. Uh, you're going to be at Rascals coming up soon, right? Yeah, the 2nd of December I start. 2nd of December yeah. you start. Now, uh, people get tickets, they call, it's on the screen actually, you're appearing. 973-736-2726. Yeah. And that's December 2nd through December, what is that, 6th, Sixth, right? 6th, yeah. And we both don't know how to read, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, any last thoughts for the audience about uh, just the point of what we talked about here? Laugh and learn, and I think you've shared some good thoughts on that ah uh, man i would I, my best point i would i would say man if you if you truly truly think that you know what you're doing with anything that you do man just for for real don't listen to anyone because people sometimes ask me for advice younger comments and i'm really reluctant to give advice man so only take advice from someone you really respect and even if that advice doesn't suit you man don't listen to it you know so, Great so advice. Ad advice man don't listen Great. to it listen to pleasure all right pleasure may your future be as bright as a diamond see you next time